Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Elena Whittam on implementing the medication uh, assisted treatment standards. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement and hence there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Elena Whittam uh, to speak around 10 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Today I want to assure the Chamber that I am determined to, to continue to work across these benches, across all sectors, across each and every community, the length and breadth of Scotland, to embed the critical aims of the national mission to save and improve lives. My thoughts are with everyone impacted by the loss of a loved one. And to begin, I would like to acknowledge the suspected drugs death figures published last week by Police Scotland. That management information report provided an indication of current trends in suspected drugs deaths. It covered the period from January to September 2023, and it reported that there were 900 suspected deaths, which is 13% more than the same period um, of 2022. I am absolutely steadfast and determined to turn the tide on drugs deaths, and what is a real concern for me right now is the increasing appearance of synthetic opioids in the drug supply. This increase is being seen across the United Kingdom. I will cover this later, but these new drugs, especially nitazines, are being found in a range of substances, and they bring with them increased risk of overdose, hospitalisation and death. That is why the MAP standards are so important. The second annual benchmarking report published in June illustrated that there was clear progress being made in a number of areas across Scotland. I would therefore like to take this opportunity to again thank everyone involved for, in working to change services for the better. Change is happening. From my meetings with individuals and various stakeholders over the last few months, I have heard about and witnessed for myself the will and the drive to improve access to treatment and support. For example, on MAT Standard 3, the MAT Standards Implementation Support Team are working in collaboration with colleagues from across Scotland to develop guidance to ensure that all people at risk of drug harms are identified and provided support, ensuring pathways extend beyond the ambulance service and the emergency department, but into housing, family members, justice, third sector organisations, and include people using any substances problematically. It is important to acknowledge the hard work and determination made in relation to implementing the MAT standards, but I do not shy away from the work that is still to do to ensure successful implementation is achieved and sustained across all of Scotland. And that is why, following the ministerial letter of direction issued in June last year, I have maintained the requirement for the majority of areas to report to the Scottish Government on a quarterly basis. For seven areas, there has not been significant progress, and so those areas will provide updates on their progress on a monthly basis. However, I do not wish to demotivate or demoralise any member of staff or individuals in these areas who are working above and beyond to implement the standards, as there have been local challenges to overcome. MIST is working closely with each of these areas, and I can report that for most, good progress has been made with a view to full implementation of standards 1 to 5. It is also my intention to meet with these areas in the coming months to hear for myself how barriers are being overcome. I have also heard from individuals and from families and supporting services of how our aims are not always translating into positive experiences on the ground, and I will discuss these cases as I meet with local leaders. We know from this year's benchmarking report that standards 6 to 10 require new approaches, and I acknowledge that some of these are taking time to embed, but I remain committed to implementation in 2025. What I do see, however, is services working together more closely than before. For example, MAT 9 criteria and the mental health strategy set clear expectations that people with co-occurring mental health and substance conditions should have access to high quality and integrated care. And work is ongoing to improve care by getting the local foundations right, empowering the workforce and embedding clear lines of accountability. And as part of MAT Standard 8, we are working alongside Public Health Scotland and experts across the field to ensure that advocacy and support are in place at local level. For MAT Standard 7 and primary care, whilst this can be seen as challenging, areas are exploring different service models, such as shared care, non-medical prescribers and better joint working. And community pharmacy also has a role in improving outcomes for people. For example, there is a programme of work which has been successful in improving education around substance use for pharmacy teams. This includes the rolling out of training for naloxone use by all community pharmacies and supporting the pharmacy network in Scotland to deliver undergraduate and postgraduate pharmacy training around substance use. For MAT standards and justice settings, the MES team have led in partnership with others to develop a resource kit to support police and prison staff to implement the standards. 
There is also innovative work going on with NHMP Perth to promote recovery and to ensure that those at highest risk of drugs harm are followed up by community services. There is improvement work being undertaken in NHS Highland to support those most vulnerable in police custody, offering nursing support at first point of contact. And within police custody in Kilmarnock, the organisation With You is attending to help people there with regards to MAT. MAT implementation needs to be based on hearing and listening to the voices of people who use services. However, areas need to go further than listening. We need to drive improvement based on the feedback gathered from those with lived and living experience. That will often mean making changes to how we do things. And last week, I had the pleasure of attending the launch of the National Collaborative's Draft Charter of Rights. The Charter helps people to understand their rights and sets out the kind of actions public bodies, including the Scottish Government, will be expected to take in the context of the forthcoming Scottish Human Rights Bill. This strengthens efforts already underway as part of implementing the MAT standards and, crucially, it ensures that people are involved in decisions which affect them. Successful implementation of MAT and, indeed, our national mission requires a skilled, resilient workforce. And it is therefore crucial that services are able to attract, retain and support staff. And we are engaging extensively with partners to get a clear understanding of the specific steps required to drive improvement. And these steps are set out in the Drugs and Alcohol Workforce Action Plan, which was published earlier this month. This action plan details the key workforce priorities we will deliver over the next three years. And I want to offer the reassurance that significant progress has already been made towards delivering a number of these. Whilst I am committed to ensuring MAT standards are fully implemented, I fully recognise other emerging threats we need to be aware of and tackle, including the threat from synthetics such as netazine. We have improved our surveillance to monitor drugs trends and what is in the supply through our rapid action drug alerts and response or radar system. This has allowed Public Health Scotland to issue two public health alerts this year on specific substances, with one for synthetic opioids. Alerts aim to raise awareness of risks for individuals, families and for service providers to deliver vital harm reduction, including the provision of naloxone. We have already seen synthetic opioids appear in the supply through surveillance, and these substances, which are significantly stronger than regular opiates, are a massive concern for everyone, not just in Scotland but across the UK. The UK government issued its own alert around netizens in the summer and the National Crime Agency last week published information estimating that there had been 54 netizen related deaths in the UK in the last six months, nine of which were in Scotland. I discussed this issue with the UK government and other devolved administrations at the UK drug ministerial meeting held last month and I am committed to continue to work with UK colleagues on this issue. And I also recently met with international experts to discuss their experience and I will hold a round table with stakeholders to discuss operational issues early in the new year. We know that naloxone works on synthetic opioids, therefore our aim is to continue to increase the number of kits in general circulation with the public to provide initial medical treatment. In addition, we are working with our cities to establish drug checking facilities and uh, of whom are aiming to submit licence applications to the Home Office to allow these to be established in the coming months. In Glasgow, we are supporting the setting up of a safer drug consumption facility, and this will be able to offer emergency care in the instance of an overdose, which is even more important if there is an increase in consumption of synthetic opioids where an overdose is more likely due to their increased strength. And in Glasgow, the Enhanced Drug Treatment Service treats people who have had prolonged heroin use and have had little or no response to traditional opioid treatment methods. This has been evaluated to work safely and effectively and has ensured a safe supply of diamorphine as a harm reduction method for this population. We've also seen an increase in use of cocaine and the harms associated with it. There is, however, no medicine available which can act as a substitute, but there are other types of treatments such as psychosocial interventions and supervised detoxification. There are third sector organisations who are leading the way in helping people with cocaine problems. Indeed, the Healthcare Improvement Scotland MAT Learning System website recently published a blog which detailed how a charity in Ayrshire, Harbour Ayrshire, are helping people into recovery from cocaine. Moving forward, continuing implementation of the MAT standards will drive further change, and I remain committed to the timelines which have been set out. We must also be alive to the emerging threats, and services have to adapt, as they have been doing admirably thus far to meet these new challenges. To conclude, Presiding Officer, MAT implementation should remain at the forefront of what areas are doing. This work is saving lives. Stigma is being tackled. Workforce is being valued and areas are, 
sharing learning and best practice, with everything coming together to save and improve lives. And finishing, I must pay due respect to the continuing commitment from this chamber. Your challenge and desire to see change is welcome as we look to full, equitable and sustained implementation of the MAT standards in all areas across Scotland. Thank you, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next line of business. And it would be helpful if those members who would wish to seek to ask a question uh, could press the request to speak buttons. And I call Sue Webber to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement. A very timorous manner for that one today. Last week, uh, data released by the Scottish Government re revealed that drug deaths have risen for the first time in nine months, for the first nine months of 2023 by 13%, compared to the same period in 2022. And this is an additional 103 lives that have been tragically lost to, life, to drugs and is unacceptable. The Scottish Government is focused primarily on harm reduction and the de-stigmatisation of drugs. The 10 MAT standards are their vehicle to deliver this, but one they are failing to deliver, having pushed back the full implementation of these now until April 2025. The Minister has mentioned specifically in her statement progress with MAT standards 7, 8 and 9, but perhaps the most important MAT standard is MAT standard 1, same day access. It means that people can access treatment or support on the day they present to any part of the service. Yet national drug and alcohol treatment waiting times were published today, showing that only five out of, that showing that five out of 13 health boards did not meet the standard that 90% of people referred for help will wait no longer than three weeks for specialist treatment. If health boards and ADPs cannot provide treatment within three weeks to 90% of the people, how many are capable of achieving same-day access to treatment, in other words, MAT Standard 1. Minister, you stated that you're absolutely steadfast and determined to turn the tide on drug deaths. If this is true, every avenue must be explored. Will the Minister finally get behind the Right to Recovery Bill? Minister. I recognise Sue Weber's commitment to working um, on this area and um, her passion for that. What I would say from the outset is that access to specialist treatment is slightly different than access to same-day treatment for MAT standards. So um, perhaps there's a little bit of work I need to do to actually communicate that more effectively. Um, we are seeing progress in achieving MAT standard one right across the board, um, which is very welcome. What I would say with regards to um, looking at harm reduction, Harm reduction is a form of recovery, and I don't think that we can separate the two out. I absolutely am committed to make sure that we extend access to residential rehabilitation. We have committed over £37 million to seven um, capacity projects where we are seeing people accessing that in, in, in numbers that we've never seen them before. Last year, we had 812 people access a publicly funded placement into residential rehab, which was a 50% increase. So I am committed to working across the chamber and I'm also committed to looking at the Right to Recovery Bill when it's published because I'm really interested to, to understand um, how they have actually addressed some of the concerns that were raised about unintended consequences at the consultation stage. But I absolutely give my commitment to have a look at it once we see the detail of it. Could I remind all members who wish to seek to ask a question to make sure they press the request to speak button. I call Jackie Bailey. I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement, although I found it to be wholly depressing. Um, MAT standards 1 to 5 are still not fully implemented, and there is no guarantee on whether standards 6 to 10 will be delivered by 2025. And as we've already heard, the fact that the number of drug deaths has increased by 13% when compared to last year is simply shameful. Since a public health emergency was declared four years ago, almost 5,000 lives have been lost. So any progress on MAT standards and on a safe consumption room pilot in Glasgow are steps in the right direction, but much more needs to be done. The massive cuts handed down um, by the health and social care partnerships by the, to the health and social care partnerships by this SNP government have resulted in the reduction of men's rehab services and the planned closure of Turning Point, who provide women's rehab services in Glasgow. Their funding was slashed by £850,000. And despite rising numbers of drug deaths, the SNP have cut funding 
to alcohol and drug partnerships by 46.3 million in real terms. That tells you all you need to know about SNP priorities. So can the minister tell me what she is doing to stop the cuts for drug rehabilitation and treatment services so more people do not lose their lives in Scotland? Minister. I absolutely recognise that we have lost far too many people in our country to wholly preventable deaths. What I would um, say to Jackie Bailey is that we have um, drug and alcohol services have seen significant increases in funding as a result of the national mission. This increase in funding into drug policy represents a 67% increase in funding from 2014-15 to 23-24 in real cash terms, according to figures published by Audit Scotland last year. So whilst I do recognise that there are issues in terms of funding, we have to recognise that in the year prior to where we um, traditionally think of the, the, the services having a reduced budget, we have seen a 67% increase in real terms. With regards to turning points and other services like that, those are decisions that are not taken by this government. I do anticipate and understand why people are um, afraid of what might happen with the, the closure of such a service. And I'm actually looking to the Health and Social Care Partnership to explain how they're going to support some of the most vulnerable women, especially within their, their city centre, who are experiencing multiple and complex needs. So I am alive to all of those issues, and I am determined that with the budget that I uh, am in control of, that I am going to make sure that those monies get to the places where they need to be um, and that's going to give us the most um, result for, for the money that we can invest. Uh, there are a number of members obviously who wish to seek to ask a question so we will need briefer questions and briefer answers. I call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Sandish Gohani. Thank you. During recent engagement with my local ADP service lead, the issue of medication costs was raised. So can the Minister provide an assurance that health boards are meeting the costs of medications that potentially save lives, such as Buvidal and Naloxone, in the same way that other patient groups would have access to life-saving medication? Minister. I thank Audrey Nicholl for that question. It's a really important one at this point. Buvidal and Naloxone are medicines that need to be available everywhere to help save lives of some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. And it's simply unacceptable for health boards and IGs, IGBs to single these medicines out to be treated differently to all other medicines. If we think about stigma, stigma is actually pervasive in all areas of, of our culture when it comes to um, issues around about drug use. My officials have met with chief finance officers and ADPs to ensure that the cost of these medicines are being provided for appropriately. For boards where there still may be some confusion, we will be writing out shortly to give clear instructions on the need to properly fund the availability of Bovidal and Naloxone. I call Sandish Gohani to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, and to declare my interest as a practising NHS GP. Minister, your statement today, like many statements we have heard before, does not actually say anything, except that drug deaths have gone up by 103 more people, real people, with real families, this is completely unacceptable. Minister, you also stood there and said that you are absolutely steadfast and determined to turn the tide on drug deaths, yet your record does not back up your rhetoric. When will we see the introduction of safer consumption rooms in Glasgow? Minister. I recognise that across this chamber we all want to see the reduction and I recognise that each and every one of those people as an individual, I have met with several families um, so far in this job and I know of far too many people and families who have um, suffered that loss. So I am going to remain steadfast. And one of the things that we can do to support those individuals who sometimes are at most harm within the city centre, who are injecting in public, um, who we know from the, the report taken away the chaos in 2016, require that safer consumption facility. Um, the Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership are working at pace to make sure that they have staff members in place come the spring and that we hope that that facility will be open by the summer months once we have the, the infrastructure in place. Emma Harper to be followed by Paul Sweeney. Sir, the Minister will be aware that I have been working to ensure that the MAT standards are implemented for rural parts of Scotland, such as in Fries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. Can the Minister provide an update on how implementation is working in rural areas versus urban areas? And can she comment on how stigma reduction work is progressing in rural Scotland, such as through the importance of local recovery cafes like Borders and Recovery Group, which takes place in Hoyk, Gala, Kelso, Eyemouth and Peebles? Minister. 
Both small teams and those in remote and rural settings have particularly uh, particular challenges. However, ADP areas with remote and rural settings have demonstrated innovation in terms of maximising the use of technology and flexible models of care so that people could benefit from equitable care and treatment. I think those in our remote and rural communities have always had the adage that Hafti is a good master, um, as my grandpa would say, and they are very innovative in their, their approaches. Um, and Emma Harper has mentioned Borders and Recovery, and um, that's a, an organisation that I would like to get down to in the new year to actually meet and discuss with them how they deliver their support services within such a, a rural setting. Um, but I am keen to make sure that we, we, we see our um, rural um, services develop. And we know that stigma prevents people from accessing the treatment and support that they need and that they are entitled to. And it can be um, the specific impacts in rural areas. There is work taking place locally to reduce stigma, with all ADPs reporting that they consider stigma reduction within written strategies or policies, including the MAT standards implementation plans, alongside a range of other actions. And nationally, we published our stigma action plan last year, um, which outlines our plans to develop a voluntary accreditation scheme to tackle structural stigma and to implement a national programme of activity to challenge social stigma. And I will keep the Chamber updated on the progress of that plan. I call Paul Swinney to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. An evaluation of Glasgow's diamorphine assisted treatment service pilot found that those engaged with the service decreased heroin use and saw improvements in their overall health and well-being. So very positive signs there. But the evidence shows that diamorphine assisted treatment works. But the Glasgow service has helped just 30 people since it was launched in 2019. Very restrictive capacity. So what is the Scottish Government doing to increase that capacity so that more people who use drugs with complex needs can access this treatment in line with MAT Standard 2 on choice? Minister. I absolutely recognise um, the, the question that Paul Sweeney puts to me, and I, I recognise that the, the model that's on offer within Glasgow um, started during COVID, and we saw that there was an interruption to the amount of people that were brought on board. We know that that's increasing um, as time passes on from, from COVID, but I'm also aware that there's other models that we can um, um, you know, implement across the country. So there has been funding that's been made available for, um, you know, projects to actually look at whether there's scoping exercises in, in local areas to actually take it on. And I've actually um, had discussions with Cranston and other organisations about how perhaps that can be um, delivered in different parts of the country in different models. And I'm willing to work with any local area that wants to do that. The government's ready um, to stand side by side with um, local partners. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, President Ross. I'd like to remind the Chamber that I'm the Vice Chair of Moving On Inverclyde, uh, a local recovery service. Uh, there are important differences in drug-related Death data collection methods across the UK. And can the Minister speak to these differences, the consequences for the comparability of the figures, and also the continued steps being taken to ensure that improvements in data collection take place here in Scotland? Minister. The definitions used for drug death statistics are consistent across the UK, but there are important differences in data collection methods and in the death registration systems that affect the comparability of the statistics due to different levels of missing data across the UK nations. The same problem from comparability found with identifying drug misuse deaths also apply to the figures for all individual substances and drug categories. The drug misuse death definition is the main headline figure used in Scotland, but the drug a drug poisoning death definition is a more accu accurate comparator with the rest of the UK. And the Scottish Government remains committed to improving our data and surveillance around drugs, deaths and harms, for example, through our Rapid Action Drug Alerts and Response Surveillance System, to assess emerging threats which we have seen come into its own just recently, and to share information to reduce the risk of drug-related uh, drug harm and recommend rapid and targeted interventions. We've also seen um, great advances in toxicology reporting in Scotland, um, and that is something that I know um, ministers in the rest of the UK um, have looked to, towards us for, for leading in that, because the more that we can identify the substances, the more that we can then introduce harm reduction measures. I call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Annie Wells. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And the Minister will be aware that she carries the good wishes of these benches in her mission in this regard. In November, I raised with her the threat posed by synthetic opioids, which can be up to 100 times stronger than morphine. And in the United States in 2012, 2,500 people died after using them. By 2022, that number had leapt to nearly 80,000 deaths a year. Presiding Officer, that could be the canary in the coal mine for what's happening here in Scotland. We know that there's been an increase in the use of nitazines, a synthetic opioid that has been been linked to nine deaths in the last six months. So can I ask the Minister if she will commit to more regular monitoring and updates of Parliament about nitazine use and mortality so that we can be clear if this is a wave that is about to break here? Minister. 
I thank Alex Cole Hamilton for his question, and it is something that I've been pondering myself as to how we can make sure that the information that we get from the radar reports, the information that we collect um, from the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and their, their programme that they have where they're monitoring people in real time as they come into A&E, um, that we can actually collate that information and look at it in totality because I am really concerned about what might be facing us coming down the line. I have um, visited with local organisations just this week and heard where we've had to have the deployment of four doses of naloxone within a service to actually reverse uh, a, an overdose. Um, and this is really concerning. And what's concerning me as well is these netizens are being found in substances that are not linked to heroin. So somebody's not actually anticipating that they're taking a netizen. They're perhaps buying an illicit benzodiazepine or even using a vape, which is supposed to be a cannabinoid type vape. And there's netizens contained there, therein. So yes, I will commit um, to, to keeping the chamber um, abreast of the, the emerging threats, but also to try and figure out how we actually respond in an even quicker time frame. Um, Annie Wells to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. In your statement, Minister, you said that there has been a rise in cocaine use and its associated harms. And you also stated that there is no medicines available as a substitute. There are other treatments, treat methods available, one being supervised detoxification. Can the Minister explain how supervised detoxification will be delivered and if there will be a requirement for residential rehabilitation? And if so, can the Minister explain how these residential placements will match demand? Minister. Annie Wells asks a really important question because um, the rise in cocaine use, um, we are seeing it right across the country and we're seeing it in different age groups and different cohorts of individuals. And whilst at this point in time there is no um, medication substitute for um, such a stimulant, de detoxification actually can work very well. So we have committed £5 million per year at the moment to actually look at our stabilisation and detoxification provision across the country. £3 million of that um, is to increase that provision and there's £2 million that's actually about a rapid capacity building fund. Um, and what I would ask is that local areas look perhaps to work together collectively on that so that we can increase the provision um, in terms of the, the placements for stabilisation and detox because they are a key part um, in our mission and they're also that key link between community recovery settings um, into that detox setting, stabilisation setting and then perhaps onto residential re um, rehabilitation if that's right for the individual. Um, so happy to keep Annie Wells um, informed as we go along there. I call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Julian Mackay. Thank you, President Officer. The MAT standards emphasise a multi-pronged approach to treatment and residential rehabilitation as a potential course for support. Can the Minister provide an update on the progress being made in expanding and improving access to publicly funded residential rehabilitation? Minister. Yeah, following on um, to the question that Annie Wells has just posed to me, um, Jack and Debar actually asked another really good question. We are committed to expanding access to residential rehab. Um, we have um, an investment of 30, uh, £37 million pounds in seven residential rehabilitation capacity projects across the country. And through this and other funding over the course of this parliament, we are working to increase overall residential rehabilitation capacity by 50%, which is an increase from 425 to 650 beds. We are also moving at pace um, to, stand, to develop a standardised approach to commissioning residential rehabilitation services through work with Scotland Excel. And they have also supported us to create an online service directory that will be available soon to allow services and individuals to see what is on offer across the country. We are providing funding to support residential rehab um, we have placements of, including five million per year to ADPs and additional funding through our present to rehab scheme and through our capacity programme. And this morning, Public Health Scotland published their report, which shows a further increase in the number of referrals in the first two quarters of 2023-24, with a total of 477 statutory funded placing, placements being approved. This is an increase of 126 placements when compared to the same pe uh, period in the previous year, where 812 placements already showed a 50% increase in placements overall. So we aim to increase the number of statutory funded placements by 300% over the next five years so that by 2026 at least um, 1,000 people are publicly funded for their placement in residential rehab. I call Julian McKay to be followed by Claire Hockey. Drug use is not a simple issue but rather something that is compounded by factors such as deprivation, poverty and exclusion. 
what training is being provided to ensure that these interrelated and interlinked issues are being dealt with? And given the Minister's acknowledgement that experiences on the ground are not always good, how are we ensuring that when things do go wrong, they're evaluated, addressed and, where appropriate, are being used to improve knowledge and individual practice? Minister. I thank um, Gillian Mackay for that um, question. It's a very important one with, with several facets to it. As per MAT Standard 8, the Scottish Government is working with Public Health Scotland and experts across the sector to ensure that people who use drugs have access to independent advocacy and support for their housing, their welfare and income needs. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that those who use alcohol or drugs are supported to access services and that staff are trained to understand the wider complex needs of people who use drugs. And in order to ensure that these important but complex interlinked issues are recognised, REACH Advocacy have been awarded funding to deliver training on the implementation of MAT standards as part of a wider human rights-based approach. This training allows frontline staff and managers across statutory and third sector um, services to develop their knowledge of MAT standards and human rights legislation in order to provide holistic and rights-respecting care. There's also a fundamental part about where we actually recognise um, where things have gone wrong, that we really take on board that learning, and then that learning can be cascaded to other frontline services. And I'm also really cognisant just now, um, after hearing from directly from frontline services yesterday, about how the impact of actually repeated um, overdose re um, reversals is having on those members of staff. So we're also looking towards supporting um, members of staff's well-being as well. And I call Claire Thank you, President Officer. And I refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest. I hold a bank staff nurse contract with the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. As the Minister is aware, Standard 9 states that all people with co-occurring drug use and mental health difficulties can receive mental health care at the point of medication-assisted treatment delivery. And I note the Minister mentioned Standard 9 in her statement. Can she give a further update and further information on the progress of implementing this MAT standard? Minister. I thank Claire Hawhey for the question because this is a real fundamental part of ensuring that people that have co-occurring issues with substance use and mental health issues are not bounced around services, which happens far too often. We have commissioned Healthcare Improvement Scotland to produce an exemplar protocol um, which will build on best practice from across the country and internationally. This will ensure that every area has access to a high quality document which they can base their own protocol on. Once the exemplar protocol is made available to the local areas early next year, HIS will offer strategic change management support and this support will help local areas to adapt the exemplar protocol to their own circumstances, pilot elements of the protocol and then implement it fully. In addition, we will work with HIS and stakeholders, including NEST, to ensure that we have the appropriate training and data reporting to support and monitor improvements. By implementing the exemplar protocol, local areas will also be implementing MAT Standard 9 with co-occurring um, support where, where it's needed. However, the protocol is not limited to opiates or medication-assisted treatments and will actually support much more people um, in terms of their substance use. Thank you, Minister. That uh, concludes the statement, and there will be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you. <laughs>